Good evening, friends. I'm very happy to meet you all this evening for this AGS Prime Time, the flagship event of the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons. Friends from India, friends from across the globe, good evening, good morning. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have two exciting talks lined up for you to learn from their wisdom and vast experience. Prime time may have the actual event of the Indian Association of Professor Papad. Friends, from Professor Sunil Papad is the President of the Indian Association of Gastroenterology and Surgeons. He is also the Chairman of the Neil Hospitals at Ahmedabad. He is an endoporgate surgeon by himself and he also has a special interest on endotherapy. She also specializes in advanced laparoscopic surgery. And in spite of having these corona restrictions, Professor Sunil Papad has been creating new avenues and new platforms for learning and he's taking IAGS to higher strides. May I invite the president for his few words to start. Over to you, president. Thank you, Dr. Knagwell. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, friends. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of IAGS Prime Time. IAGS, an organization of 8,000 laparoscopic and GI surgeons of India, is into its 20th year of existence. And the organization which started with the membership of 25 in 1993 has progressed to more than 8,000 members due to the support and current and the IAGS mass and senior leadership. I'm pleased to welcome here Professor B. Krishna, who is also considered father of GI endoscopy in IAGS and in India and has been a guru to all of us. Welcome, sir. I welcome our eminent foreign faculty today from uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, Dr. Matthew Crow. Today we are having two eminent faculties. First, Dr. Matthew Crow from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, who is going to talk on recent advances in foregut and bariatric GI endoscopy. Dr. Crow has been a prolific foregut surgeon, has worked so many years in Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, and is now chair of GI and laparoscopic surgery at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. Welcome, Dr. Crow. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. D. Nageshwar Reddy, who is chairman of AIG in Hyderabad, which is Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. Dr. Nageshwar Reddy is also guru for me for ERCP and advanced endoscopy and has been awarded Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan and many other accolades from across the world. American Society of Gastroenterology also awarded with Master Endoscopist, which is considered Nobel Prize in GI Endoscopy. So friends, should we are having two eminent GI Endoscopists from across the world, and they are going to showcase the recent advances in the GI Endoscopy. IAGS is organizing IAGS prime time fortnightly, and this program has become very, very mature and very popular across the surgical fraternity of India. Now we are regularly getting more than 1,000 listeners for this program since last several programs. And I'm very happy today that we have two eminent speakers with senior leadership from IAGS. Without much ado, I will invite Dr. Kanagwell to proceed with the today's scientific program. Thank you, President. Thank you for uh, sharing the information and uh, introducing the program. Now, I have the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Suvira Jha, uh, a good friend of all of us. And then he's a dynamic uh, laparoscopic surgeon and robotic surgeon. He had a brilliant career 
spanning across various states, having his school education later. He graduated out of Christian Medical College Bellu and he did his master's from the Christian Medical College Bellu. And he had his uh, fellowship in the minimal access surgery from the GEM Hospital Spangatur. And later he has worked at multiple places. He also has a very uh, keen in health education and quality management of uh, health, health issues. And he also travels widely and he's been a much welcome faculty in all the minimally invasive uh, fellowship programs and has been uh, contributing a lot on the academic grounds and various platforms. Professor V has been instrumental in uh, creating this uh, connect with Professor Crow. Uh, can I have the honor of inviting Dr. Suviraj to take over the proceedings, please? Over to you, Dr. Suviraj. Thank you, Dr. Kanagbeel. Thank you very much for the kind and generous introduction. Thank you, President Rusunit Bhakwit, uh, for making my job easier and introducing a very uh, eminent speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Matthew Crow from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, it's also a privilege to be in the presence of legends like Dr. Krishna Rao and Dr. Nageshwar Reddy. Uh, thank you very much, IGS, uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, this evening, to introduce our first speaker, Professor Matthew Crow is currently the chair of the Digestive Disease Institute at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. He's also currently professor of surgery at Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine uh, at Ohio in the United States. He'll be shortly taking over as vice chair of innovation and emerging technologies, along with being a professor of surgery at the uh, facility at Cleveland Clinic in uh, the US. He's going to remain active in the clinical field with leadership roles in laparoscopic surgery and surgical endoscopy. His uh, active academic and research interest spans over two decades with hundreds of publications. The key thing in context today I will bring to your notice is that he's been the pioneer in introducing endoscopic and single port interventions at the Cleveland Clinic facility in Ohio. Especially of note has bring to bring the uh, per oral stenotic sleeve myotomy, the per oral endoscopic pylora myotomy, and the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm not going to take more of your time. I'm going to leave him to introduce these topic heads as well as his immense experience. Over to you, Crow. We keenly look forward to your uh, experience and expertise to be shared with us. Uh, thank you, Subaraj, and, and thanks to the IEGES uh, and leadership for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak with you tonight. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope that uh, we can all uh, see each other again in person in the not too distant future. So my talk tonight is on new vistas in foregut and bariatric endoscopy. These are my disclosures, really none of which are pertinent to this talk. And the goals for the next uh, uh, time together here is to, to review current surgical endoscopy techniques with specific foregut applications and look at future applications for surgical endoscopy and training. Uh, one of the themes that I want to focus on tonight is that surgical endoscopy is at the crossroads of specialties in gastroenterology, advanced interventional gastroenterology and surgical endoscopy and the, the providers that perform this uh, often are from both fields, and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate on, on strengths, and that'll be a recurring theme in my talk tonight. But I think that many surgeons in, in certain parts of the world don't realize the rich history of surgeons in endoscopy, uh, because many of the, the common interventions that we uh, currently employ in um, endoscopic procedures were initially described by surgeons. And surgeons today uh, may not do uh, endoscopy at the level of our uh, gastroenterology colleagues, but many gastrointestinal surgeons do. Uh, and it's an incredibly useful tool uh, for preoperative evaluation of patients, especially in revisional surgery. It allows for tissue sampling and location of lesions that need to be resected. In the operating room, we can use this to look at uh, anastomo uh, anastomotic integrity or to treat bleeding. And then postoperatively, we can manage complications, and I'll touch on some of these uh, topics tonight. But I think what is most probing and hopefully compelling to the audience tonight is that endoluminal surgery um, is an evolving field that both surgeons and interventional gastroenterologists need to be active parts of, because really, endoluminal surgery equals surgical endoscopy, performing operations uh, through an endoscope. 
And if we look at evolving endoluminal techniques, and, and many of you would consider these to be amongst the uh, cutting edge and most commonly performed uh, procedures, much of this has really become evolved endoluminal techniques uh, from ablation of Barrett's mucosa, EMR, ESD, POEM. Notes in certain centers with expertise exist, but the, the first four really are relatively commonplace worldwide. And the types of tools that we have are increasingly complex and are starting to look much more like our laparoscopic instruments with the ability to dissect, retract, use advanced energy and divide. These instruments uh, have end effectors that can be changed, a separate scope, often within a scope or uh, adjacent to it that allows for different planes of manipulation of tissue. And the instruments that we use commercially available to perform endoluminal procedures look a lot like our surgical devices as well, whether it's a triangle tip knife or an insulated tip knife for tissue division or even a hook knife, which looks very similar to our laparoscopic hooks, end effectors like caps that allow for tissue distraction and dissection. Suturing devices have improved significantly with the ability to take larger and more robust bites of tissue for apposition and with different types of suture, including permanent and absorbable. And closure devices allow us to bring larger pieces of tissue together as well. So I think before we dive into what is coming, I'd, I'd like to just refresh the audience's mind in terms of what is endoluminal surgery today, not tomorrow. And the the diseases and disease processes that have largely been supplanted by endoluminal interventions, one of which is RF ablation for Barrett's. This is a landmark article using uh, radiofrequency ablation in Barrett's esophagus in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2009. Looking at patients with IM, complete eradication, 77%, low-grade dysplasia, uh, 90%, and high-grade dysplasia, 80%, in an intention-to-treat analysis. This has allowed us to shift the uh, focus of uh, Barrett's um, uh, largely to an endoluminal procedure. And then when there are other lesions that need to be resected, whether it's in the esophagus or the stomach or the lower GI tract, EMR is a, a long-standing technique that allows us to remove lesions of certain sizes for pathologic evaluation. <clears throat> but increasingly now we're able to do uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection. And this is different than EMR because we can take larger uh, pieces of tissue, either for uh, curative intent or to get a large enough specimen uh, to accurately stage a patient. And, and this is um, initially described for curative intent with those lesions that have negligible risk of lymph node involvement uh, and that are confined to the mucosa, not the submucosa. But if we look at EMR versus ESD, it's largely about size. So EMR and ESD are both largely successful in terms of resecting lesions less than 10 millimeters. That drops off significantly once it goes above 10 and up to 20. And above 20 millimeters, the success rate of ESD is still quite high in expert hands, um, but uh, it's nearly impossible to get uh, uh, an on-block R0 resection with EMR for larger lesions. So how do we take these techniques to other applications? So this is a, a, an opportunity for surgical intervention, not surgeon intervention, but surgical innovation. Uh, and, and this can be from a GI or surgical standpoint. And I think one of the most uh, impressive transitions currently is the application of intramural surgery performed by endoscopy for POEM, uh, for achalasia and other esophageal motility disorders. So the first reports um, initially were in the 1980s, but these were blind incisions and experimental uh, uh, modern poem was performed in 2007, but Dr. Haro Inoue uh, published the first human report in 2010. And for the surgeons here, we know that uh, Dr. Heller described a, a, an elegant and successful operation uh, that many advanced laparoscopic foregut surgeons thoroughly enjoyed to perform. Um, Initially, a, a transthoracic anterior and posterior cardiomyotomy, and then a transthoracic single anterior myotomy in the early 1900s, and then revolutionized by the thoracoscopic, then laparoscopic revolutions in the early 1990s by Koscheri. And we know that the success rate of laparoscopic intervention is excellent um, when performed by surgeons who have experience doing this. So, why innovate? Well, we know that there's a spectrum of patients that present with achalasia. Uh, medication, can be uh, used, uh, but this is usually for patients that are not good candidates for intervention. 
Pneumatic dilation uh, has been shown to have excellent short-term effects, but there's a relatively high rate of uh, symptom recurrence and a not insignificant perforation rate. Botox um, can be effective in the short term, it's safe and easy, uh, but uh, has to be repeated and is certainly not definitive. But really, Heller myotomy is, is probably what we consider to be the standard by which others should be evaluated. Um, even though it's done laparoscopically, there are potential surgical complications. We have long-term data uh, and uh, efficacy with this uh, intervention. And now uh, the, the new, uh, well, not even new, but newer intervention is, is POEM. Uh, it seems, at least in the short term and now some longer term data, it's, is similar efficacy to Heller. It, it's less invasive because it's performed transorally. It is a complicated technical procedure to perform and, and longer term data is lacking. Uh, this is an intramural surgical procedure, so not endoluminal and not transmural, but within the wall of the GI tract to form a submucosal tunnel and then a myotomy of varying lengths down through the LES and then onto the cardia of the stomach. Uh, with the endoscopic imaging, uh, you can selectively divide circular muscle fibers. This is the LES that's been divided after POEM uh, with the longitudinal muscle fibers intact, completely divided LES. Data shows that it's highly effective in the short term with multiple studies showing uh, effectiveness of Eckhart scores of less than or equal to three and greater than 90% uh, of patients. And increasingly now that the world's experience with POEM uh, has increased, we now have up to five-year data with multiple studies showing durability over that time. In a recent systematic review and meta-analysis of 53 studies uh, on laparoscopic Heller myotomy and 21 studies on POEM, at 12 and 24 months, POEM appears to have better dysphagia improvement. Uh, but we do have some concerns about GERD long-term um, a recent New England Journal of Medicine article addressed this, but we'll have to see what long-term reflux looks like in patients with POEM. But clearly the data looks uh, uh, compelling up to this point. But let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so we have POEM, uh, and we have this principle of intramural surgery, but let's move a little bit further down the GI tract from the LES uh, to the pylorus, from uh, POEM to G POEM or to POP which we uh, refer to as peroral pyloral myotomy, which is an evolving series of peroral acronyms in GI surgery. So gastroparesis is a vexing disease, uh, both for, for gastroenterologists, uh, internal medicine physicians, and surgeons. And, and there's a spectrum of interventions. We know that there's a high rate of medical failure. Um, gastrectomy is indicated. Sometimes there are gastric electrical stimulators, and sometimes patients need decompressive gastrostomy and feeding jejunostomy. But where does... Uh, pyloroplasty or division of the pylorus fit. So this is an interesting progression of data from uh, the group in Oregon, Lee Swanstrom's group and, and Kevin Revis. They initially described that laparoscopic pyloroplasty is safe and effective first-line surgical therapy for refractory gastroparesis. And I think most foregut surgeons would agree that's a reasonable option, but if you can do that laparoscopically, then you can probably also do it with an intramural approach with peroral endoscopic pyloromotomy from the same group back in 2015. Similar to palm procedure, um, a spot typically on the lesser curve of the stomach is identified, a bleb is raised, and through a tunnel, the pylorus is divide, divided uh, and then sealed. And I'll show you a video of what this looks like real time. This is one of the first procedures that we, that we performed at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, this long transplant patient who had a, a peg with a jejunal extension and was having recurrent aspiration pneumonias uh, for gastroparesis after lung transplant, which is not uncommon. So about four centimeters proximal to the pylorus along the lesser curve, uh, we make an injection through the relatively thicker mucosa uh, with blue dye to differentiate between the muscle uh, and the submucosa, and then ultimately the mucosa. The mucosa of the stomach is, is thicker than the esophagus, so it's a deeper incision with a TT knife here. This is actually a transverse incision which we find is easier to make that uh, mucosal flap. This is usually about 15 to 20 millimeters in size to allow access to that submucosal plane here. You can see that the mucosa is being uh, deflected downwards. And then we use a TT knife uh, and spray cautery to then carefully separate that loose areolar tissue away from the underlying uh, mucosa and then the muscle above. The tunnel is expanded. We, we typically repeat injections. Um, this is a biliary extraction balloon that we're using to inject here. We do a little bit of hydrodissection. 
uh, and what you see is uh, kind of in that 10 to 2 position, the pylorus of the stomach, uh, and that submucosal plane uh, below with some CO2 injection. Once the pylorus is identified, similar to poem, a myotomy is performed uh, through uh, pylorus and then onto the duodenum, the duodenum. We very carefully look at the muscle fibers. Obviously, the serosa of the duodenum is, is quite thin. Um, and we want to make sure we don't have a full thickness injury. This is a division of the uh, pylorus, and then this is divided retrograde back onto the stomach for about a, a distance of, of one centimeter or so uh, to make sure that we have complete destruction of uh, the pylorus. <clears throat> the scope is then withdrawn from that tract uh, after examination of the uh, tunnel to make sure that it's hemostatic. We use a, a horizontal uh, series of clips to, to close the, the relatively thick mucosa of the stomach here in a transverse fashion and then passes the scope into the uh, duodenum through the pylorus shows that it's uh, larger uh, and easy to pass that scope uh, with the um, cap in place. So we published our initial series of 50 patients uh, in surgical endoscopy and then later in the journal of GI surgery and uh, our, our first 100 patients was published in the uh, Annals of Surgery, looking at a spectrum of patients. So 56% were idiopathic. These tend to be uh, more women um, and younger. 21% were diabetic and 19% were post-surgical. So remember some of the, the other surgical interventions don't work so well on post-surgical patients, but POP or GPOM can be performed on post-surgical patients. All these patients had a, a GCSI questionnaire and both the solid and liquid gastric emptying study at 90 days. So we had a symptom score as well as objective radiographic evidence. The technical su success um, uh, was um, 100% with an average of 33 minutes of performing the procedure. GCSI uh, improved from a, a pre-procedure to 3.8 to post-procedure to 2.5. This was statistically significant. And importantly, the objective evidence of, of improved emptying occurred in 78% with a mean improvement uh, and retention by reduction of uh, 3%. So I think these are great examples of how uh, from uh, a foregut standpoint, endoluminal uh, treatments exist and are being applied in the creative ways how this is gonna be applied to other uh, GI processes. But when we look at bariatric surgery, endoluminal interventions have existed for quite some time, initially from treating complications now to revision and also to primary therapies. And I'm just gonna run through this briefly to give you an idea of, of the current state and, and hopefully some brainstorming about where you think uh, applications can occur in the future. So one of the earliest and most effective interventions is um, TTS through the scope, balloon dilation uh, for strictures. This is effective uh, with good response rates for most strictures, even for long segment strictures like you see on the right here. Endoluminal treatment of leaks after gastric bypass. This is a real wide gastric bypass that has a leak. You can see the contrast extravasation and a couple of drains in that position. Uh, are still and historically have been treated very well with esophageal stents. You have to remember that um, esophageal stents are off-label use uh, for treatment of anastomotic complications. Uh, they are uh, FDA approved for palliation of malignancy, but there's a, a plethora of data on efficacy, and I'll show you a little bit of that. But we now have better devices. Uh, surgical endoscopy is ripe for innovation, and even esophageal stents are now asymmetrical. They can be delivered over a wire, which is how we did it historically, but now also through the scope with deployable devices uh, through an endoscope. At Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, we published a series of endoscopic stents in the management of anastomotic complications after foregut surgery. Large of these were bariatric uh, surgeries, but they also included other foregut operations. And if we looked at the indications, the leak indications, especially for sleeve gastrectomy and Wu and Y, the overall efficacy was quite high. But we know that with these more chronic conditions like sleeve stenosis or long-standing fistula are unlikely to resolve uh, with esophageal stent placement alone. In our series, we had a 77% improvement, uh, and this was in highest uh, in terms of resolution among uh, leak in the acute phase. But beyond that, stents allow patients to uh, improve their overall nutritional status by increasing oral intake within the first 24 hours. But importantly, almost a third of our patients did acquire eventual uh, reintervention by operation. And if we look at the, the indication uh, for 
esophageal stents, the, the International Sleep Gastrectomy Expert Panel Consensus has had several iterations, but, uh, and, and this is one of the earlier ones. Categorization of leaks is critically important because the more chronic they are, the less likely they are to resolve with esophageal stent placement. We know that esophageal stents cause pain, reflux, and, and often patient intolerance. So we want to make sure that we're selecting the right patients to use these for. And these probably work best in the situation of uh, acute, early, and potentially late, uh, and have to be managed on a, a, a probably a two to three week interval uh, to prevent tissue ingrowth and challenges for removal. So it's, it's important to keep track of these patients and to identify which patients will benefit, most likely those that have uh, acute or uh, early complication. So I want to show you a, a series of endoluminal images of a leak, but also other indications where esophageal stents can be helpful. This is a patient that a sleep gastrectomy uh, here in Abu Dhabi at another institution presented to our emergency department a few days afterwards with um, low-grade fever, mild leukocytosis, uh, and left shoulder pain. Um, contrast extravasation was seen on a fluoroscopy, and an upper endoscopy was performed by myself, which showed this small leak just distal to the esophageal gastric junction, two to three meters. This is the same leak, small defect, relatively healthy otherwise. So I, uh, I placed a stent, uh, and this was a longer stent um, that was going to occlude this, landed in the distal esophagus, and then uh, proximal to the uh, pylorus along the, the length of the stent. But I think this case highlights the, the critical knowledge of what the surgical anatomy is for the endoscopist. So, what you'll see here are a couple of paper clips, and obviously you can see the endoscope. The distal paper clip shows the pylorus. The second paper clip shows the incisura. And you can see a contrast injection with a typical appearance of a leak, one or two centimeters distal to the esophageal gastric junction, and then tracking up to the uh, left hemidiaphragm. So as we typically do, uh, a guide wire was then placed. That third clip now marks the esophageal gastric junction. You can see the stent being passed down through over uh, the wire. And as the stent is deployed under fluoroscopic and an endoscopic imaging, you can see that tightness at the incisura. It's not necessarily a stenosis, but as you can see in the lower part of uh, this image here, not only was it initially narrowed in the incisura, there's actually a fold there. So the most common complication leading to leak after sleeve gastrectomy is no longer technical failure of stapling. It's no longer encroaching on the esophagus. It's actually no longer stenosis of the incisura, but torsion or twisting of the staple line. And, and at least in the early term, sometimes sleeve can help alleviate some of the nausea and dysphagia. It may promote remodeling, uh, preventing reoperation, hopefully in the future. But esophageal stents are not well tolerated. There's significant reflux. Patients have uh, substernal chest pain, uh, and there's a high uh, rate of explantation um, uh, due to intolerance. And that series that I showed you earlier from Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, our explantation rate was relatively low, um, about 5% five, five or so, but other series show it to be much higher. And they're not as effective long-term for chronic leaks. One of the surgical principles that we're applying now to leak of the GI tract after bariatric surgery, but after any foregut operation is endoscopic internal drainage. And the tool that we typically use for this are commercially available biliary stents that are standard for ERCP. They're, these are double pigtail stents with a loop in the lumen and one on the uh, abscess side. So instead of covering or bypassing a leak as esophageal stents do, uh, self-expanding metal stents, these traverse the defect and allow for internal drainage. What does that look like? This is more of a, a chronic leak after sleeve gastrectomy. I think this patient was about three months out. You can still see that the surgical drain is in place there. And you can also see that it's a, a relatively well healed chronic cavity on the other side. This is about a, a one centimeter defect. So how do we do this? We place a, a very flexible, this is a Jaguar, a 0.035 Jaguar that we typically use for ERCP. We do a quick contrast injection to get an idea of how large the abscess cavity is. And then we deploy a series of these stents. So these are either seven or 10 French, typically five centimeter long, double pigtail biliary stents, one loop in the abscess cavity. You can see the loop being deployed there. And then one loop on the luminal side. 
And just like we do in the bile duct, often we'll put multiple stents in here as well because the abscess cavity will collapse around the stents, but the, the, the purulent fluid and necrotic debris will, will drain not only through the stents, but around the stents. So you want to fill that defect up with as many stents as will fit through there. And the data on this is pretty compelling. This is a study looking at nearly 70 patients with leak after sleeve gastrectomy, one to three double picked up biliary stents are placed. And as I said before, these are seven or 10 French biliary stents, changed on a four to six week interval. Average time to therapy was 52 days. The overall failure rate was quite low, 8%. And these are, are now chronic leaks with a mean treatment time of 57 days. And, eat, and, and patients underwent three endoscopic treatments overall. But you have to remember these are much better tolerated than esophageal stents. So this is often done as an outpatient um, uh, setting as long as the patient doesn't have signs of systemic sepsis. And stent migration occurred in 10%, but when a plastic double pigtail biliary stent migrates, it just passes harmlessly through the GI tract. Whereas migration with a self-expanding metal stent in the esophagus typically requires endoscopic or sometimes even surgical intervention to, to re uh, retrieve those. So obviously there are advantages to, to endoscopy. Um, it avoids surgical reintervention for complications and they have relatively low morbidity overall. But one of the challenges for beyond managing complications is efficacy uh, and, and long-term durability. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, revisional and primary endoluminal procedures for metabolic disease. We know that failure after bariatric surgery uh, does occur uh, and there's a spectrum as to why that occurs. Some are, are patient factors, some are mechanical factors, uh, some are operations, um, but there's a not, not insignificant number of patients uh, that do need revision at some point. And if we look at mechanical attributes that can be addressed endoluminally, targets such as in a large stoma, gastrogastric fistula, which was more common in, in an era of non-divided gastric bypass, but still could occur after subclinical leaks and erosion into the remnants, and sometimes for, for dilated pouches, uh, these can be targets as well. And as I talked about before, we now have better uh, suturing devices, which allow us to be um, uh, more surgical uh, in terms of our principles, as opposed to this suction and piston device, which we used to have. We now have curved needles uh, with different types of suture for more, more robust tissue apposition. And in a study uh, published in Surgical Endoscopy now 10 years ago from Cleveland, we, look, we looked at patients that had weight regain after rheumatoid gastric bypass. And uh, those patients that went uh, routine upper endoscopy, about 70% of those had an abnormal upper endoscopy. And the majority of those patients had uh, stonewall enlargement, 60%, more so than pouch enlargement or both. So what are the outcomes of endoluminal revision after gastric bypass? Chris Thompson's group uh, in Boston uh, made some of the initial uh, data on this, and this is one of his first studies looking at 25 patients who underwent endoluminal revision with a post rheumatoid gastric bypass BMI 43 with an average weight regain of 24 kilograms. And their inclusion criteria was an anastomosis greater than 15 millimeters. Uh, these were technically successful in, in all those patients with an overall reduction by 77%. Relatively minor complications overall, and at three, six, and 12 months, I think reasonable uh, uh, weight loss of, of, of 10 kilograms given the, the relative low complication profile. And his group is followed up in another publication now looking not just at three, six, and 12 months, but at 24 months and at 36 months, which shows that at least some level, this is sustained weight loss over up to three years. So you might say that that's not... Uh, long-term data yet, but it's accruing and at least up to this point so far uh, seems to be relatively compelling. Another novel application uh, of endoluminal gastrojejunal uh, revision is for dumping syndrome. And this is a study that looked at uh, GJ revision for anastomotic outlet reduction uh, for dumping uh, with um, good success in terms of, they measured this with a, a six stat score, which was statistically significant. And the authors also commented that this could be impeded um, if successful in the, in the first half, if there's a, a later initial failure. Primary endoluminal procedures for treatment of metabolic disease. Bariatric surgery is durable and effective and a lot of operations are being performed worldwide. Uh, and, and most people do very well with this, but there are many patients that are looking for, for non-surgical interventions. Endoluminal applications can be used for standalone uh, procedures for patients who may never undergo bariatric surgery 
or as a bridge. And I think that um, there's a group of patients probably in the lower BMI range uh, that either don't want surgery or are not candidates for surgery. Uh, they're patients that are high risk and, and maybe an endoluminal procedure is a bridge to definitive surgery. And then there are other patients that don't want any bariatric surgery but are ineligible for organ transplantation, orthopedic surgery, or even ventral uh, hernia repair. Intragastric balloons uh, are still popular in certain parts of the world uh, for class one and class two obesity. They're temporary. If reversible is advantageous, they are. Um, obviously, they need to be uh, deployed as part of a multidisciplinary approach. And there's multiple types of balloons that are available. There are some that have 12 month duration, uh, double balloons, up to three balloons, and now balloons that don't require any endoscopy. And if you look at uh, the results from the, the pivotal randomized control trials uh, in the US of, of different manufacturers, overall there's about a six to 15% total body weight loss compared to one to 5% lifestyle alone. Relatively low severe adverse events, but my suspicion is these are, are relatively underreported. But we do know the weight regain is common after removal. Um, the newest, uh, well, not the newest, but the, the, the most uh, looked after procedure as a primary procedure now is probably endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, which is an endoluminal approach to tubularization of the stomach. Uh, similar to, but not exactly the same as a laparoscopic plication, based on plication of the greater curvature to create a tubularized stomach. There's some data looking at uh, this. This is probably one of the better studies, looking at three centers with 24 month follow up, low no BMI, 37, six and 24 month uh, outcomes with um, a, a primary endpoint of a greater than 10% total body weight loss. On a per protocol approach, they reached this on 84%, but, but less with an intention to treat analysis less than, uh, around 50%. And the authors also concluded this may work better with adjunctive therapies, which, which is probably true for most of these interventions. Duodenal mucosal resurfacing, this is ablation of the duodenum. Uh, uh, there's accruing data on this. This is some of the early data, um, not on weight loss outcomes, but uh, this group is looking at uh, type two diabetes outcomes, people with A1C, uh, as well as treatment of, fat, of fatty liver disease, not necessarily uh, for weight loss. Endoluminal barrier liners, which uh, exclude some part of the proximal GI tract. Uh, the, the two most common devices are either exclusion of the duodenum or uh, placement in the esophagus and duodenum, and then exclusion of the stomach and duodenum. Uh, there have been challenges with this, and, and uh, uh, the uh, press release here is that the initial endo trial was placed on hold. Uh, because of a, a significant uh, adverse events of hepatic abscesses, probably from translocation of the duodenum. We were part of this trial in the United States, and, and most of the liners um, are, are, are not being used um, uh, worldwide now. But I, I hope uh, this talk has given you some perspective on the evolution of minimally invasive surgery. And Endoluminal procedures that are similar to surgery are absolutely surgery just performed by endoscopy. But I would challenge anyone to say that the, the progression we saw from open to laparoscopy really was a, a one-way progression. But endoluminal treatments in many ways will supplement laparoscopy and, and treat different patients in different ways. One of the challenges uh, worldwide is that many surgeons who want to do endoscopy or many gastroenterologists who want to do advanced procedures don't have uh, avenues for training. The BSAFE program, which is the Bariatric Endoscopy Skills Acquisition Fundamentals Exam, is a co-sponsored curriculum with the American Society of Metabolic Bariatric Surgery and the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeon Sages. It consists of three components, a web-based curriculum, video curriculum, and then a multiple choice online exam that requires a minimum passing based on the web-based video curriculum. And then once that's complete, there is a hands-on technical evaluation by proctors. It's not going to be offered this year uh, because of Corona at Sages, but hopefully we'll get it on the schedule for next year. This is the website for uh, those of you who might be interested, and I'll put my uh, email address up at the end too. So in conclusion, endoluminal technologies have already supplanted many surgical procedures. Evolving technologies allowing for more uh, complexity uh, and uh, will, will probably be applied increasingly to other GI tract diseases. 
and critically important, both surgical and gastroenterological leadership will advance the, the, the field of endoluminal surgery. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present tonight. It was a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter Crow, for that brilliant presentation. I can see why you're going to go and take a leadership position in, it, in innovation and emerging technologies. So many congratulations on that too. Uh, let me start off by taking off on one of your slides. Uh, the earlier ones in POEM, you mentioned very clearly that this is the systematic review mentioned that the efficacy in POEM seems to be better than uh, laparoscopic helix cardiomyotomy. That's the first part of my question. If you can explain maybe uh, detail that, maybe why, and how would you deal with uh, the follow-up of post-POEM GRD? Yeah, great, great questions. Well, um, I think that poem first of all there's there's challenges with that study it's a systematic review meta-analysis so there's a lot of heterogeneity in the studies that are there probably the best study is the new england journal uh, article that is a, a randomized study um and, and we can draw conclusions from that too i think that from a, a theory aspect not just for achalasia uh, but for other motility disorders of the esophagus poem gives you access to the, the entire esophagus. so for so it's type 3 achalasia you may want to perform a longer esophageal myotomy. And to perform a long myotomy up into the chest from the abdomen can be quite challenging. But with an endoluminal approach, you can start your myotomy anywhere. So maybe uh, we can do a better job by um, accessing more of the, the, the mediastinal esophagus. Um, depending on your skill set and comfort level, being able to selectively divide uh, the circular muscle fibers instead of longitudinal may have some uh, benefits. Long-term data remains to see whether that's true or not. But when we do a laparoscopic Heller myotomy, two things happen, regardless of your technique. You have to divide the phrenoesophageal fat pad and the sling fiber. So we know that the natural anti-reflux barriers are disrupted with that, and that doesn't happen in POEM. And to get to the circular muscle fibers, we have to divide the longitudinal muscle fibers first. So you know that there may be a, a, a selective advantage there. Now you have to weigh that against. Um, Sometimes it's hard to know what your, your distal margin is on, on the stomach to make sure you divide those cardio fibers. Um, and it takes some time to, to figure that out. Uh, and it's, it's a technically challenging uh, procedure to perform. And achalasia is a relatively rare disease. And to be good at this operation, you know, you should be doing a, a relatively large number of these uh, uh, in any given year. One, to get through your learning curve, and then to make sure that you're doing them effectively. And then the second question you had is, what is the long-term follow-up? Well, you know, one of the biggest challenges of any myotomy is that when the LES is divided, patients are going to be at risk for reflux. Now, we know that even with an anti-reflux procedure, most commonly a door, sometimes a toupee, there's still reflux, both clinically significant and then physiologically detected, but not clinically significant. It looks like, and, and the New England Journal article showed this, that the, the amount of, of reflux on physiologic testing may not be that different several years out. Uh, and importantly, we know that the rates of severe esophagitis, LA grade B, C, and D, probably don't seem to be that severe, at least in the early post-op period. So my protocol after POEM is to get a, a repeat time barium swallow, uh, our, our achalasia protocol, of three and 12 months. And then we do an upper endoscopy at one and three years. We don't do uh, uh, pH probes. There are challenges to that uh, for um, insurance and reimbursement, but I, I do think it behooves us to make sure that these patients aren't having uh, significant esophagitis afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go on to the next set of questions, any questions from the eminent uh, panel here, Dr. Sunil or Dr. Kanagavail? Uh, Professor Krishna Rao would like to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Rao, sir, please, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Professor Kof, for an excellent presentation. I'm going to take a bit of it. There were a point on gastric paresis and you doing a pyloric biopsy. We do the pressure studies in the esophagus. Are there any pressure studies done on the pyloric sphincter to justify the myotic? Yeah, great question. Uh, there are, but I think the data isn't as helpful as um, uh, pressure studies in the esophagus. So 
uh, metametric uh, studies or, or real-time uh, measurements of pressure have been used uh, in POEM to gauge the effectiveness of the myotomy and whether additional myotomy needs to be done. The challenge with the pyloris is that the pressures are so variable, it's hard to know what the baseline is. And then once you divide it, whether that's improved or not. So I think there's active research to be done there, um, but it's not as standardized as it is, as it is in the esophagus. The uh, second point that struck me was you have dealt with so many endoscopic features. Have you had any experience with the magnets for anastomos? I have not. So the, the, the commercially available device is something called magnemoses. And, and just for maybe people who are less familiar with that, it's an in, endoluminal deployed self-affixing magnet uh, that simultaneously from an upper endoscopy and a lower endoscopy pairs. And then once they pair, they cause local ischemia, fusion of the bowel, and then a, a distal anastomosis. Well, obviously the normal GI tract is still open, but now there's a, a, a decreased circuit distally. Um, I do know, at least anecdotally, this is a challenging procedure to perform. Uh, it seems compelling, um, but remains uh, a few steps away from prime time or, or kind of routine use. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Professor Crow, uh, Professor Neil, please, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Dr. Crow, excellent lecture, and you covered all these new procedures very nicely. As you are a surgeon and you are doing poem as well as uh, Heller's myotomy, when a patient of ecclesia comes to you, your choice of procedure and why? Great question. I think everybody gets a poem, except potentially for very young patients with type 2 agalasia. I, I think that those patients, the concern for long-term reflux in somebody who's 18, 19, 20 years old uh, over many decades. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant and I have a longer informed consent discussion for them. But otherwise, my practice is probably 90% plus poem, 10% uh, Heller myotomy. Okay. Dr. Kanagwe. Yes, Kanagwe. Uh, Professor Crow. Uh, uh, Trusting the uh, data which has been emerging out of uh, the G boy and other things. Do we have any study, uh, especially in the sleeve leaks, to tell there is an increased pyloric pressure inherent to the patient? Have we tried to look into some data? Or do we have some studies? It is quite interesting to see leaks are managed in a very unique way. But does it mean that we are missing a vital leak? which can potentially avoid leaks after a sleep cancer. It's an, it's an inter interesting physiologic question, and this has been debated. There's very little data on this. The, the best analogy that I can give you is that there is data looking at Botox injection prior to pop, g -POM or POP, not for sleeve leaks, but in, in another area, or for treatment of gastroparesis. That data has not been compelling or showed any difference, and it's relatively well constructed. Now, maybe it's a little different in a sleep gastrectomy where you have a tubularized stomach, it's a high pressure system, uh, and so maybe smaller fluctuations could be more important. My personal thought is that the distal obstruction is less likely from a pylorus, which we know is very dynamic. It's, it's rarely stenosed, idiopathic, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, typically a disease of, of childhood. Uh, rarely in adults, but you know, sometimes we see a type pyloris, but I think it fluctuates so much. I think more commonly the distal obstruction is from torsion or stenosis, not necessarily from a tight pyloris. But, but the literature doesn't guide us in, in that exact scenario. Well, point is well taken, sir. Thank you very much. Do we have time for a question or can I wheel or? Yes, sir. Please, one final question. Recruit, thank you for uh, highlighting the fact of the distal sleeve, the a point at the incisura and the potential risk for torsion and its impact on the proximal aspect of the sleeve. Uh, how are you addressing this issue uh, at primary surgery as well as dealing with it? Uh, does it change the profile of GRD presenting to you besides the morbidity of a post-operative situation? Yeah, I, I think there's two things that, that contribute to it. One, I think that there's been a movement to try to move closer and closer to the pylorus. 
And I, I think that there's two problems with that. Physiologically, it gets rid of the antral pump um, and you, you probably are at more at risk for reflux. And, and we know that a sleeve gastrectomy can cause reflux um, uh, because of the high pressure lumen. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think four centimeters is probably where you want to be. And as you get closer to the pylorus, that first staple fire tends to be more horizontal. When you start to get very horizontal, then make that turn around the incisura. If you're not very careful about keeping the anterior and posterior stomach in the same plane, you get this torsion. Now, torsion is very different than stenosis. We, I think for the most part, stenosis has decreased. Most of us use sizers to make sure that we don't staple too close to the lesser curve. Um, but the torsion may not be seen clearly on an upper endoscopy because you can get a scope through. It's not a narrowing of the lumen. And if the endoscopist isn't familiar with bariatric uh, anatomy, may think, well, there's nothing there, but it can be a functional outlet obstruction. Now, the problem with it is that unlike stenosis, which can be treated pretty effectively with a pneumatic dilation to, to, to tear the muscle but keep the mucosa intact, torsion is less likely to respond to that because, again, it's not a stenosis. It's a functional obstruction. So, unfortunately, a lot of those patients uh, will need conversion, typically to a root wide gastric bypass. They have symptoms of dysphagia and reflux, and that's from a mid-body obstruction. Thank you very much. And you really picked this up on your follow-up endoscopy done by the surgeon. Uh, is that right? Or you go with a upper GI series? I think both are helpful. Um, an upper GI series can sometimes show the, the contrast, usually twisting posteriorly as it comes down. That, that's a sign that there's torsion, even though the, the column of contrast is the same diameter the whole way down. And then an upper endoscopy. And the upper endoscopy lets you see if there's significant esophagitis as well or other anatomic abnormalities like a, a large fundus or a hiatal hernia. Uh, could I actually be brave enough to say that here lies the benefit of the surgeon doing the endoscopy himself, post-op or maybe intra-op, so he can follow that line along the greater curvature and see how much of a twist there is? Absolutely. I, you know, I do an endoscopy on every patient in the OR, even a sleeve gastrectomy. I'm not even looking for leaks. I just want to make sure that that staple line endoscopically looks like it does laparoscopically, that there's no torsion, that things are wide open. Uh, and to identify any abnormalities, including bleeding staple lines. And then I think that if you're going to operate on a patient for a sleeve revision for reflux, you personally want to know what it looks like. And that's a great opportunity for uh, you to do an endoscopy to, to play. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're out of time for this segment. So to connect with, I yield the floor to you. Thank you very much for the crew. And we look forward to you staying with us for the second half. And maybe if there's time, we could take questions at the end. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Super. Thank you, Professor Pro. Uh, so, Nil, sir, you'd like to chip in for a comment before we move on to the Nagesh versus uh, talk? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Crow. It was a wonderful lecture and uh, procedures you showcased. Uh, I believe that with the advent of uh, bariatric surgery, many of the bariatric surgeons started learning and doing upper GI endoscopy themselves. And last five years, we are seeing that majority of the bariatric surgeons are doing at least post-op endoscopies themselves so that they understand the problem from inside. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Crow? No, I think, I think it's critically important. I think for any GI surgeon uh, to, to add endoscopy is important. And I think just as you described it, it, it is a great way to start. You keep building on that. So you may do... A screening endoscopy for a patient who has reflux before you do bariatric surgery, or maybe a patient has dysphagia and you do a diagnostic endoscopy afterwards, or you scope everyone in the OR. Then you start to build on your skill set. Um, then maybe you can treat uh, bleeding or an anastomotic stricture. In, in each of these are, are specific skills that you can expand upon. Uh, and I think as a bariatric surgeon, you know what that anatomy looks like from the outside. You should know what it looks like from the inside too. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Crow. Uh, we'll move on to our uh, second uh, speaker today and topic today on uh, ERCP in 2021 and beyond. I will invite uh, Dr. Kunagwell to start the second lecture. Thank you, President. Professor Crow, we'd love to have you amidst for the second talk. Or if you have any pressing commitment, 
please feel free to go ahead with your commitment professor pro it's been a pleasure having you on board for this important event thank you subhiraj for uh, hosting professor pro and uh, acting a bridge of connect between the ids and professor pro and i am sure ids will look forward for more academic celebrations from professor pro in the near future thank you and good night professor pro thank you very much now uh, i have the privilege of welcoming uh, professor krishna rao sir my teacher and uh, i have been uh, starting my endoscopic career in the very same room where professor uh, krishna rao sir did his first endoscopy in south india and uh, sir has been uh, having a very illustrious career he has been the johnston medalist for people who do not know what is a johnston medal in undergraduate period in madras medical college it is a coveted medal who get the maximum number of medals in the madras medical college undergraduate career in fact there are many years these johnston medals go unawarded because it does not reach a target and he is one of the most prestigious winner and the same thing he is the uh, dr chipperfield's uh, gold medal winner during his ms uh, education so two crowns on one head and later no looking back he has been trained by the giants like so professor sohendra and the similar group of professors at the wisconsin university tokyo medical school and bear not and to his credit he has touched the lives of at least 10000 surgeons on the field of minimal invasive surgery or endoscopy or endotherapy and he has been instrumental in various modules creation of new avenues for learning and he has been continuing to be a pillar of learning source for all the young surgeons and young endotherapists and in fact i would say he has become mentor of mentor of mentors so that is the amount of generational knowledge and wealth of experience professor krishna rao has and we are indeed blessed to have him amidst us for this evening's program professor krishna rao sir i think you have a pleasant duty of introducing professor nagi sir over to you professor krishna rao sir uh thank you kanagwel for your very very kind words we introduced rajeshwar reddy to an endoscopic uh family is taking cold to bermuda right <laughs> the rajeshwar reddy has graduated from the postgraduate institute in chandigarh had his dm there and thereafter he has excelled himself in therapeutic endoscopy he has established a internationally recognized center in hyderabad he has many things to his credit it will take a long time for me to go through them individually but he was the first person to do the notes transgastric or paroral transgastric appendicectomy and all that as a move He has had many innovations in the endoscopic procedures. He is the only person from India who has been able to take part in active endoscopic procedures, both in the United States as well as in Europe. And I think he has trained a large number of gastroenterologists. and surgeons in various aspects of endoscopy at the AIG i think i look forward to hearing his lecture on ERCP present and future because he always have many things up his sleeve for us to learn and appreciate nagi i hope you are there to take over your lecture while well, uh, dr nagesh reddy is joining uh, good evening sir professor krishna rao good evening nice to sir yeah nice to see you very active in academics and you have always been an inspiration to all of us see i am there to help people who want to learn and this is one of the 
methodology by which we can transfer our knowledge and our techniques to the younger generation and also to help them in various aspects of GI. I started off as open surgeon of a GI, laparotomy and proceed. That was the methodology that was there in 1965-66 because we had no endoscopies or anything except we had to go by the barium meal the pictures. Then the laparoscopy came, then we came the endoscopy therapeutic procedures. Then I got interested in the application of lasers in GI, both in open surgery as well as in endoscopy. Some of the things that really interested me was that the persons whom I had trained are now the teachers and training the next generation of students in therapeutic endoscopy, in laparoscopy, and proceeding on. They are innovating things that we are unable to comprehend as to where tomorrow the endoscopy will be in the armamentarium of a GI person. As uh, Dr. Crow has said, he has gone through entire gamut of the recent advances that has taken place now. But what is next? I'm very eager to see if Nagi has anything up his sleeve to tell us what he would be uh, dealing with in one particular aspect of therapeutic endoscopy of ERCP. Yeah. Yes, sir. So while yeah, well, yeah, Dr. Uh, Nageshwar is joining, uh, it seems from Dr. Crow's lecture that we'll be moving more and more towards uh, endoluminal surgery. Uh, can I ask a question, Dr. Crow? Uh, you could unmute yourself, sir. Uh, there has been some excitement with transoral incisionless fundoplication with a device called Isofix. Uh, I think the brevity of time didn't give you to expand on that maybe, or is, is that purely notional right now, or is there some credibility to that initiative? We had Streta in the past. Right, I, there's credibility. I, I think that you have to look at the evolution of the device. Initially, it was a gastrogastric plication. Um, and, and if you do a gastrogastric plication, you know that there's cardia above your, your fundoplication or plication. Uh, the, the latest iteration is a gastroesophageal plication. It's less of a um, fundoplication than a plication. The early data seems relatively compelling, um, but like many anti-reflux procedures, we need longer term and objective data. Quality of life scoring is not gonna, quality of life scoring and PPI use are not the outcomes we need. We need pH probes um, and we need data in at least one year or, or longer. So that, that doesn't exist yet, but from a technical standpoint, that the current iteration is, is better than the previous ones. Thank you. We had some early experience with endoscopic gastroplast, and I see that's your go-to uh, destination for people who are not ready for laparoscopic or robotic bariatric surgery. You had a 10 or 15 percent uh, total body weight loss at about a year and more. Uh, is this part of your regular bariatric discussion for low BMI people, or is it somebody who comes demanding it? So I, I'll back off those a little bit. We offer the procedure, but it is a very small percentage of our patients. I have to tell you that, that in our experience here in the Middle East, the long-term durability or even the short-term durability at, at 12 months or so doesn't seem to be super durable. So I think this is ideal for patients that are low BMIs, probably 35 or less, that may not be eligible for surgery, uh, low metabolic disease burden, um, and I think that there's going to be a not insignificant long-term weight regain after these procedures. So I, I think we just have to caution on this. There's a lot of, of enthusiasm around the world. I perform it, but in very highly select patients. Most of the people who come asking for it are not candidates. Thank you. We have Dr. Nagesh ready with us. Over to you, Dr. Kanagwela. Dr. Krishna Rao, sir, please. Uh, welcome, Nagesh, to the Thank meeting. You. Uh, I just gave a small introduction about you. 
to the listeners and who participate in this uh, webinar. I think I don't have to repeat it. So I, yeah, I pass it on to you to proceed with your uh, lecture on ERCP 2021 and future. Thank you very much, sir. First of all, I'd like to thank the Surgical Society, Sunil especially, for giving this opportunity. Thank you, sir. And also, it's a big honor to do this talk under the chairmanship of Professor Krishna Rao because Dr. Krishna Rao was actually the true inspiration for me to take up ERCP. Uh, maybe 40 years back, when uh, one of my aunt had a CBD stone, I had taken her to Dr. Krishna Rao. Uh, he was actually one of the, maybe one or two people in India doing ERCP. I was fascinated by the way he took out the CBD stone. And since then, of course, I've been in this area. So thank you very much, sir, and the honor to be doing this uh, with your chairmanship. Um, the first uh, ERCPs were actually done by a surgeon. McEwen in 1968. He was in Washington. He was a surgical gastroenterologist who was attempting to do an ERCP. Uh, he reported the first series of 55 cases uh, in, in annals of surgery. Uh, what happened at that time was uh, scopes were not very good. The view was not very good. It took him almost uh, uh, four hours to do each case. And he, of course, was a very busy surgeon. He got disgusted and then stopped doing ERCP. But since then, the Japanese took over the ERCP, and it was a Japanese uh, physician, Ito Ari, and others who actually further progressed, and then ERCP became a standard of care. In 1973, uh, Maynard Klassen and Kawai did the first spintrotomy removing CBD stones, and this actually heralded the therapeutic ERCP. And since then, of course, ERCP has become the standard of treatment of many pancreatic or biliary disease. Now, what do we expect further on from now here in 2021? Um, the major advances in ERCP have occurred because of advances in techniques, technology, and of course, changing concepts that have occurred in this area. So what I'll do over the next um, maybe 20, 25 minutes is to go over these changes that have occurred and how ERCP is revolutionizing the treatment of pancreatic biliary disorders. But also the advance in other areas coming in this and therefore, in certain areas, ERCP is actually receding, and let's look at this. But one of the most major advances that has occurred in ERCP, in my opinion, is our ability to prevent post-ERCP pancreatitis. Among all the complications that ERCP, which is the invasive procedure has, the most dangerous has been pancreatitis. It used to occur in about 9 to 10% of patients, but in recent years, with the use of rectal endomethacine, prophylactic pancreatic stents, and IV hydration, we have managed to decrease the ERCP pancreatitis rates to about 2%, which is, I think, a significant advance because we can now do ERCP fairly safely uh, when it's indicated in this group of patients. The other major advance that occurred in ERCP is our ability not to do it for unnecessary indications. For example, spintrophoric dysfunction was a major indication in Western world for ERCP where patient with biliary pain or type 3 type of SODs underwent DRCP. And following this, the incidence of pancreatitis is to be quite high. This uh, landmark study in JAMA by Peter Cotton and his group showed very clearly that in patients with abdominal pain after cholecystectomy, uh, the so-called SOD3 patients, uh, ERCP should not be done because it produces more complications than actually uh, solves the problem. And therefore, I think we have become wiser and we started choosing our patients carefully. So what's going to happen from next year onwards is our next few years is that indications for ERCP are going to become very strong and we'll probably do a proper um, ERCP only when it's indicated. The other major advance occurred in this area is advances in accessories. For example, we're starting to use more and more the self-expanding metal stents. They're replacing plastic stents. And we realized that in self-expanding metal stents, which are actually made of this nitinol material, the material is getting superior. So these stents are developing a much higher radial force. They're expanding. We learn from our cardiologists to use them carefully. And also we know that these stents should not only have a strong radial force, but paradoxically, they must have a weak axial force, the longitudinal force should be very weak. Only then these stents will function well. 
So we are now having stents which have a strong radial, weak axial force, and these are the ideal stents. So these stents are now slowly replacing plastic stents. For example, we used to now think that in patients with uh, advanced obstructive malignant jaundice, you have to put plastic stents, and those who have a lifespan of more than three months, we put metal stents. But this has now been shown not to be true. In this very large Dutch study, we, we have seen that all patients, irrespective of the stage of malignancy, a self-expanding metal stents is more economical and better palliative treatment for these patients rather than putting plastic stents. Similarly, we have published a study in patients with benign biliary structures, chronic pancreatitis, post-transplant situations, where we used to put multiple plastic stents. We no longer use it. We now use a completely covered self-expanding stent in this situation. This is better than multiple plastic stents. And therefore, what we have shown that even in benign structures, a completely a covered plastic a metal stent is better than multiple plastic stents. So what is happening is now the demise of plastic stents in the use of ERCP. As we go further on, uh, we are going to get a new dawn of metal stents. Self-expanding metal stents, technology is improved, the variety available, especially in the eastern countries now, they're manufacturing very, very different kinds of stents. And therefore, I think the future is going to be use of these stents in our patients. Another type of stents are going to be used in future is so-called biodegradable stents. Now, the advantage of these biodegradable stents is once you put them in, either in the biliary tract like these stents or in the pancreatic tract like these stents, these stents will stay in place for six months or eight months and then spontaneously get biodegraded. And therefore, you don't have to remove the stent. So, there are more and more now these stents are going to be used. And this is an example of a benign biliary structure in a patient who had a cholecystectomy done, uh, what we are doing is to use this uh, special biodegradable stent put across the place. And this stent goes in and with the stent, we can open up uh, the biliary structure. Once the structure is completely open, we leave the stent in place for about three months. And after that, uh, the stent spontaneously dissolves. You can see how we are expanding the structure with the stent and the balloon. And after three months, this uh, stent is... Uh, dissolving spontaneously so we don't have to remove it and this patient does not have to come back for a checkup. So this is a major advance and I think more and more these biodegradable stents are going to be used in ERCP for benign biliary structures, in post cholecystectomy leaks and in patients who have to undergo new adjuvant therapy before surgeries, single procedure assumption. Similarly, in pancreatic benign ductal structures, prophylaxis for pancreatic stents for ERCP, we can use this so you don't have to go in and take it out again. So a lot of indications are coming up. And I think for the next few years in ERCP, we are going to use more and more these uh, biodegradable stents. The other major advance has occurred and where we are moving towards is in endoscopic adjuvant therapy. For example, in a patient with a pancreatic uh, or a cholangiocarcinoma who is advanced, who whom surgery cannot be done, we should just put these stents and just leave them alone for palliation. They should live for three months, maybe six months. But we are now thinking further on. We are thinking, why not we put a stent and also give them adjuvant therapy, either with photodynamic therapy or radio frequency ablation, and increase the lifespan. What, so what this does is that we can improve palliation, increase survival, increase stent patency, improve quality of life by one of these methods, photodynamic therapy or radio frequency ablation, which are now doing routinely. The most dramatic results have come with photodynamic therapy, and these are results from Ortner's group in Germany, who showed that if you have a patient with advanced cholangiocarcinoma, you just put a stent, the patient lives for 98 days. But if you do a photodynamic therapy and then put a stent, this patient is living for 490 days. This is the dramatic difference. Uh, so also, we know that you can prolong survival by this technique, but unfortunately, photodynamic therapy has several disadvantages. You can have a severe photodermatitis. These patients cannot go out in sunlight and so on. So what is the alternative? The alternative is radio frequency ablation. And now we are starting to use this more and more. This is from a Korean company, Starman, where we use these catheters, which can be passed in ERCP into the bile duct. And then we give uh, radio frequency ablation at uh, a temperature of 75 degrees for two minutes. And then again, the efficacy is again quite dramatic. You can see a cholangiocarcinoma here. 
uh, we can see a cholangoscopy picture how thin this structure is. We after radio frequency ablation it opens up, and we have now shown that in these patients, not only do we increase survival, you can see the survival is markedly increased with radio frequency ablation, but also the stent patency is increasing, and this probably decreases the incidence of cholangitis and again increasing. Uh, survival. So, therefore, in all patients with cholangiocarcinoma, where surgery cannot be done or cure cannot be given, we are now palliating these patients using self expanding metal stents plus radio frequency ablation. And we are now achieving survival rates which are reaching between four to five years in many of these patients. So, you can really dramatically increase the survival in these patients with this. And this is, I think, uh, going to increase further with a combination of radio frequency ablation, um, of course, uh, giving palliative chemotherapy plus stenting. So, you see, palliation with ERCP now has taken a different terminology. In fact, we're talking about intermediate uh, lifespan in these patients. So, what is happening in 2021 and beyond? Plastic stents are being replaced by self expanding metal stents, either uncovered or partially covered. And we're adding adjuvant therapy to these patients. Similarly, for benign biliary structures, we used to use multiple plastic stents. We are now using a completely covered self-expanding stents, but we are moving towards a biodegradable stents. So the whole uh, movement is towards something which is much more convenient for the patient and for uh, the doctors. Now, coming to another area, difficult CBD stones. In a CBD stone like this earlier, we used to go for surgery, but now using a combination of a balloon dilatation, that is, we do a spintrotomy, followed by a large balloon dilatation. And you can see even large number of stones or even large stones can be very easily removed using these techniques of a combination of spintrotomy and balloon dilatation. So endoscopic uh, post-spintrotomy balloon dilatation has really revolutionized the treatment of CBD stones and they are no longer difficult now. In fact, uh, uh, this is a meta-analysis which compared plain spintrotomy versus spintrotomy with balloon dilatation. You can see very clearly that for stones which are more than one centimeter in size, so-called large CBD stones, a combination of uh, balloon dilatation with spintrotomy can very safely remove all these stones without the need for mechanical lithotripsy. The other major advance that's occurred in this area is the introduction of the so-called spy scope or the single operator cholangioscopy, where you can insert this scope through the ERCP channel into the bile duct or pancreatic duct and then do a variety of uh, procedures. So you decrease the radiation, you directly visualize the bile duct, you of course have better tissue access and you can do directed therapy. And this is a study from Los Angeles uh, published uh, some time back where they actually looked at large CBD stones and saw how cholangioscopy can improve your capability to improve these stones. And you can see in conventional and ERCP techniques, success rates with the large stones was only two thirds. Whereas when you combine cholangioscopy laser, in majority, almost all these patients, these stones could be removed uh, without the need for further surgery. So therefore, I think what is going to happen is more and more we are going to use this cholangioscopic technique of removing large CBD stones. So if we combine large balloon dilatation with cholangioscopy, then almost 100% of CBD stones can now be removed endoscopically without the need for surgical intervention. And this is happening in the area of pancreatic stones also. We can see this is large pancreatic stones. So we can actually put in a cholangioscope and using a EHL probe, these, cholangio these stones can be completely fragmented. Uh, you can see a patient again, uh, Pancreas divism is stone, a lot of mucin, and then there's a structure there, and using again laser through the cholangio pancreaticoscope, we can do a structure of plasty, similar to what a surgical structure plasty is done. I think these are advances which are going to see further and further. These ducts can be opened up completely endoscopically, and then of course we traverse the whole duct. So the visualization of the biliary system is going to improve so much. So it's the cholangio carcinoma. In fact, uh, this is a structure. Biopsies were negative, but once we use a cholangioscope, we can visualize this and directed biopsies can be taken very easily. And uh, this can make a dramatic difference. In fact, I'll, let, I'll show you two examples of two recent cases we have seen. Both the cases on ERCP showed strictures in the mid or higher part of the CBD. Diagnosed as cholangiocarcinoma because 
other investigations were negative. But when we actually did a cholangioscopy in these cases, you can see in this case here, they turned out to be a mass. Biopsy from this mass showed it to be a lymphoma. Whereas the case on the right, you can see caseous material coming out of this. And of course, this showed an acid fast bacilli indicating this tuberculosis. And both of these cases responded to medical treatment without the need for surgical intervention. Of course, significantly decreasing the morbidity in these patients. So these are the advances that occurred. And another thing that's going to happen in future, this is a study we published uh, recently in GI endoscopy, where we took patients with indeterminate biliary strictures. So what happens is normally when you do ERCP and uh, we look at these patients, the strictures, it's very difficult to say whether this is a cholangiocarcinoma or a benign stricture. So what we did is we took these patients, randomized them into two groups. One of them underwent... Um, standard ERCP brushings and biopsies like what you do conventionally. The other group we immediately put in a cholangioscope and did cholangioscopic biopsies. And you can see very clearly in the so-called indeterminate biliary structures with an accuracy of almost 90%, we could make a diagnosis of a cholangiocarcinoma or a benign stricture when cholangioscope is direct, directly done. So therefore, more and more at ERCP, when you see a stricture where brushings and biopsies are likely to be negative, we do a direct cholangioscopy and take a directed biopsy. So therefore, the practice of ERCP is changing a little, becoming more aggressive towards actually visualizing the lesion under cholangioscopy and taking biopsies. Similarly, another area where we have dramatically improved our yield and therapies is in patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic stones. We use a combination of extracorporeal shockwave with the trips with ERCP. And this is a recent the publication of ours in pancreatic baby at 5,000 patients with chronic pancreatitis and stones using a combination of extracorporeal shockwave and ERCP in about 90% of these patients who could clear the stones, uh, making them asymptomatic and then follow up. The other area where we have new problems coming up now is in patients with altered anatomy. Many of the patients, especially in the Western world and now in India, undergoing bariatric surgery. So when you do bariatric surgery and ruin by anastomosis, you cut off the stomach uh, from uh, continuity. And therefore, doing an ERCP is very difficult in this situation. We can do an enteroscopic assisted ERCP. These are often difficult. Uh, we can do lap assisted ERCP. You can see an example here where in the remaining stomach, we can make a small opening and go in with the ERCP scope along with our uh, surgical colleagues. Or so nowadays, we are doing... U.S. guided gastropexy. So what we would do is put a stent between uh, these two stomach remnants, metal stents, go in through the endoscope and then do the ERCP, come back and close the openings again endoscopically. So all these are new advances. So as we go forward, beyond 2021, these are going to become common modalities that surgeons, that um, uh, endoscopists are going to use to overcome these problems. The, one of the major issues that has occurred now in recent years is ERCP-related infections, the so-called carbamin-resistant enterobacteriaceae. The CRE organisms have caused a major problem, and this was initially in Seattle from Dick Kozarek's unit, and then UCLA, there was a major report. Uh, this is because the ERCP scope as a complex tip is very difficult to clean it because bacteria can lodge here. And this CRE type of bacteria can cause severe infection and death. And this caught, um, I think, attention of this um, press where the superbug was supposed to have caused um, infections and deaths. And therefore, it also uh, caused the attention of our endoscopy colleagues where we started trying to look at why this happens. And we found that at the tip of the ERCP scope is this O-ring where the elevator is and it's extremely difficult to clean this ring. And therefore, you can't really sterilize the scopes completely. Uh, so there's a problem here. So now the manufacturers are trying to get over it by using uh, disposable scopes. So future ERCP scopes, and even now we started, all of our scopes now have so-called disposable tips. All the manufacturers are having this so that we can eliminate this problem of um, infection. And uh, we're starting to find that this is a good method. But what happened also was that FDA caught attention of this problem and they're trying to move ERCP towards a completely disposable scopes. And uh, you can see these are uh, disposable scopes. The Exile scope is a single-use geotinoscope which is currently available. We have now started using it in our department. The problem is the cost. Fortunately for us, other companies are coming up, so the costs are going to go down. Uh, 
for this disposable scope. But this is the only way to ensure that you're going to do an infection-free ERCP. And uh, these scopes, you can see the view is quite uh, good. Uh, they are single use, and this is uh, the first live demonstration that I had an opportunity to do at Orlando uh, last year, where we use this uh, diod disposable deodinoscope in a patient uh, uh, who had a very complex pancreatic ability obstruction. And you can see the view is quite good here. We could do a CRCP spindrotomy and immediately after the procedure disposed of the scope. So you see, these disposable scopes are becoming a reality. And of course, we are going to use it only in certain indications because of the cost. Uh, we are still using reusable ERCP scope. We are modifying it to decrease the infection. But disposable scopes are going to come with limited use, especially in patients who are very sick, who have multiple infections, who have had transplantation done. You can't get, you are careful about transmitting infection or patients in intensive care unit where you can't transport your whole scope there. In these cases, we are starting to use these disposable scopes. But as the price of these scopes come down, their use is going to increase. And my prediction is by 2025, most of the ERCPs are going to be done by disposable scope because the cost of the scope is coming, going to come down to say $200 or less. And then it's going to be the standard of care in these patients. So sterile single-use endoscopes are going to come. But what is challenging the ERCP in general is more aggressive endoscopic ultrasound, uh, which is taking over many functions of ERCP. And this is an example where there's uh, endoscopic uh, uh, ultrasound drainage of the biliary tract can occur either from the stomach or from the duodenum. Uh, so this is more and more being used by an endoscopic ultrasonologist to drain malignant obstruction. Uh, there was this randomized control study which came from Florida group, Sham Vardhraduri and others, who actually started saying, why not we do primary drainage by endoscopic ultrasound rather than ERCP for patients with pancreatic cancer and showed in this study that primary drainage of the biliary system was as effective on endoscopic ultrasound as with ERCP with less complications. But I think uh, the problem, of course, is that this is going to take time. Right now, ERCP is still going to be the main method of uh, treating these patients. But there's several unanswered questions in ERCP, which over the next few years, we have to try and answer them. ERCP is a risky procedure. The volumes are dwindling. There are less randomized control trials because of less volume all over the world. And experts are coming down. So therefore, there are going to be questions asked of how we'll have to train our future endoscopists in proper ERCP, decreasing the risk, how to optimize our therapies with proper trials, and how to see that certain competency or skill level is maintained in ERCP. I think I'm glad that surgeons are increasingly taking up ERCP now. In our own unit, for example, Dr. G. V. Rao is a master in ERCP. And I'm, I'm hopeful more and more surgeons will take up so that this division between physicians and surgeons would go and ERCP would be a common procedure used for patients' benefit. Again, I'd like to thank um, Sunil and others for giving this opportunity, especially to give this talk under the chairmanship of Professor Krishna Rao. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rageshwar, for taking us through the future. You have already been there many times and uh, many factors and other aspects of endoscopy. And now in endoscopy, you have shown that things are going to change and change for the better. And your concept of draining the biliary tree into the stomach, transgastric, or through the duodenum. And again, to treat uh, inoperable biliary malignancy with a uh, radiotherapy is something that we surgeons should be aware of and follow it. Do you have any uh, data that after your uh, treatment of biliary malignancies, with the either the photodynamic or the radiotherapy, that they have become operable and undergone surgery. Yes, sir. So this is a very good question. In fact, uh, we have now treated the over 200 cholangiocarcinomas with radiofrequency ablation. Most of the time, we are trying to increase uh, the survival in these patients and also also increase uh, 
palliation quality because the stent blockage dates is less and therefore they have less cholangitis. But in a few patients, especially those in the mid part of the CBD, after the radio frequency ablation, when we're following up these patients, following chemotherapy, we found a fairly dramatic reduction in size of the tumor. And these patients could undergo uh, Whipple's resection successfully. So this is, I think, going to be another future area where we can use this to downstage the tumor so they can undergo more radical surgery. Have you used this? Have you used the same procedures in carcinoma head of the pancreas? Uh, yes. The problem with carcinoma head of the pancreas is that transductally we are not able to do it, but we can now do uh, US guided radio frequency ablation, especially for neuroendocrine tumors. We are using it quite extensively, replacing surgery because we can completely destroy the tumor of two centimeters in size, especially in high risk patient and those who are symptomatic like insulinomas now. Routinely, we are doing radio frequency ablation to ablate the tumor. Uh, these patients would not require surgery. In patients with carcinoma pancreas, we are doing it as a palliation, especially for pain, which is very severe, can't be palliated by other methods. We are using this to radio frequency ablate the pancreatic tumors. Thank you. Are there any other members of the group have questions to? Yes, President. Yeah, excellent lecture, Dr. Nagi, sir and uh, many, many congratulations for so many accolades. Every time we meet, uh, I see a long list of accolades added to your name, and we are all very happy for you. You showed one video of uh, IPM and ablation. So is it a standard of care now, or it's coming up in a big way? What it's are your thoughts on coming that? Coming up, but we still require more studies. Uh, we are now starting to use uh, radio frequency ablation for IPMS. Uh, especially now, we are using it for cases where they are borderline for surgery, either they are not accepting surgery or they have some certain risk factors, and therefore we use this. And we are finding very encouraging results. So I believe that uh, in a situation like IPMN, especially when it's not very malignant, borderline cases, there is a potential of completely ablating uh, the mucosa using this technique. And uh, we are starting to get some early results to suggest a five year survival rate is significant. So I think this is something you should look forward to in future. Keep a watch uh, in these patients. Uh, in fact, the first uh, two series of cases were reported now uh, in um, World Journal of Gastroenterology. Thank you. Another yeah, question? I'm going to tell me. Professor Reddy, sir, it's been a wonderful talk and uh, clear uh, deliberation of the data. Sir, I have a question, especially in post lipids uh, pancreatic or directly leaks. Uh, how much ERCP helps, sir? Uh, I won't tell ERCP directly. How much an endotherapy helps, especially yeah. in case of pancreatic gastrostomy leaks or a pancreatic jejunostomy leaks? What is your experience on it? Sir? So, in a, uh, it is a difficult area because our access now to the papilla is gone. So, you have two separate anastomoses, pancreatic and biliary duct. And very often, reaching that area of anastomosis is not so, so easy. Because uh, with the scope, we have to go through in a fairly long route. Uh, so in this type of situation, endoscopic therapy has a much lower uh, role. We have sometimes, especially if it's not acute, immediate post-operative, some of these people, they come to us a little later with a slightly dilated duct. In this type of situation, through endoscopic ultrasound, we have been able to cannulate the pancreatic duct anti-grade and then go in and then do therapies. But success rate still is less than 50% in these cases. Thank you, sir. The next question is, sir, it looks like uh, from you, US is going to sort of uh, technically challenge ERCP in future in accessing various ducts. Yes. Because the maneuverability looks very easier with the image guidance of ultrasound. Uh, sir, how far we are in... Uh, doing us guided ablation of pseudoaneurysms or because it looks like endovascular access to the fine vessels that the gastroduodenal vessels or other things it looks pretty easier with endoscopic ultrasound guided uh, sclerosis yeah. do you have experience on handling pseudoaneurysms and other vascular malformation with us guidance sir? i think that's a very good question again endovascular us is becoming a major subject now uh, we have some experience with the uh, portal. For example, with the US, you can cannulate the portal vein quite easily. And nowadays, in some of the units, portal vein pressure measurements are becoming routine with the US. It is more accurate than doing uh, 
HPVG, which we normally use to measure the portal pressure indirectly. This is a direct method. Uh, of course, the extreme units, which are even done tips, retrograde using US techniques. We have in our unit done uh, quite uh, quite a significant number of pseudoaneurysms trans-US because very easy to access. So through the US, we get to the pseudoaneurysm and inject glue or coins to completely block this area. So this has become, in fact, we reported a series uh, recently using these uh, techniques. Uh, again, I think this is an evolving area, quite exciting. And because with endoscopic ultrasound, you get very close to the vessel and you can get very good delineation. Plus, now you have the capability of a Doppler. A Doppler is integrated into US now. So you can actually put on the Doppler and see the blood flow. So you see the blood flow, inject glue or coils, and then again you see the blood flow which is stopped. The most important area where it has, in fact, taken over now becomes standard of care is patients with large gastric varices. Nowadays, instead of doing glue injection blindly through the endoscope, we are using US guided uh, injection. Going to the feeder vessels, injecting glue and coil at the feeder vessel so that these uh, uh, gastric viruses don't recur again. So this has become almost standard of care now. So I think endovascular US is another major specialty field that's coming. Uh, sir, how far, yes, sir. Uh, how far we are away? How far we are away from getting a master endoscope, which has the US, which has the ESCP access? So if we have one single scope, yes. I think. Uh, rather than having multiple scopes, yeah. how far is there any research happening on that side? Yes. So again, because of confidentiality, I can't reveal exactly. But this is the area we're working with a company which has made a hybrid scope, where uh, you can actually do US, and when you come to an area of the papilla, you can actually turn the lens a little. It becomes a standard ERCP scope. So a com combo scope, it's called a combo US ERCP yeah. scope, is what they're working on. And uh, that's going to become a reality, um, yeah, I think, at least in a year's time. Yes. So, yeah, excel excellent, Maggie. Uh, one more question. You are doing a lot of endoscopic treatment and ESWL treatment of uh, chronic pancreatitis stones. So, in your unit, uh, uh, do the patient go for surgery at all for chronic pancreatitis or almost all the stones are removed <laughs> endoscopically? <laughs> Now, again, this is a very good point. So what we did was, because the problem with the chronic pancreatitis, uh, the therapy can be screwed. For example, if you go to a surgeon, you get a surgery. If you go to an endoscopy, you get endoscopy. It's like uh, the barber chair phenomena. If you go and sit in a barber chair, you'll get a haircut, whatever. Even me, without hair, you'll get a haircut if you go to a barber chair. So it's called <laughs> a barber chair phenomena. And this, uh, to avoid this, what we did is, we actually set up a pancreatic board with our unit. Every patient with chronic pancreatitis goes to the pancreatic board. And we have at least uh, every week 10 or 12 cases. So they go to the pancreatic board and the pancreatic board contains uh, physicians, surgeons like G.B. Rao. And of course, we have a pancreatologist. We have a clinical pancreatologist who does only clinical pancreatology. He's Dr. Rup Jyoti has come from Mayo. He doesn't do any procedure. So he's neutral. So we have endoscopists, GI, surgeons, and a clinical pancreatologist. All of us look at the images and on imaging, we decide, for example, if the patient has a single stone or a small stones in the head region, dilated duct beyond, he would go for endoscopic therapy because we have 80% chance, especially with a powerful extra powerful shockwave machine that we have, we know that is going to. If the patient has a head mass, pancreatic head mass, multiple strictures and stones, then he'll go immediately for surgery. no discussion at all. But there are in-between patients who have, for example, one stricture and some stone, or a patient who has multiple stones. In these patients, again, we've discussed, we tell the patient this can be done endoscopically, but surgery is preferable, or surgery high risk is there because it's got coronary arthritis and so on. So we tell the patient and then give the choice to the patient. So giving this approach, we find that in fact, we have shifted from endoscopic approach a little more towards surgery because surgeons would then, for example, a head mass, there's no point in doing endoscopic therapy. You had to go for surgery. Multiple strictures, no point go for surgery. So we shifted towards, little towards, but even then, because ours is a reference center getting specifically reference, 70% of our patients would actually be relieved by endoscopic therapy, 30% would go for surgery. And I think using this pancreatic board, in fact, I strongly recommend for all units treating large number of pancreatic, chronic pancreatic patients to have a board where a surgeon, physician, and a neutral person looking at it. And imaging will give you a very clear-cut decision on which patient to treat uh, 
based upon what you find on say even a plain x-ray is sufficient very often to give an opinion but an mrcp almost always decides what to do in these patients yeah thank you nagi we have uh, dr matthew crow from uh, abud clinic uh, and i would invite him to ask a question or uh, make a comment yeah outstanding lecture uh, I, i appreciate the opportunity to learn from you i have a question in terms of the complexity of endoscopy now so we have advanced endoscopy which is now so many different buckets but with the the spectrum of procedures you describe with eus and ercp is pancreatic or biliary advanced endoscopy different than intramural different than luminal and and how do we address this in training are are, are we going to be just one of these or can anybody do them all i think matthew that's a fantastic question excellent question in fact that's what's bothering us also as we go in fact i was uh, the president of world endoscopy organization and we had several sessions addressing this endoscopy has become so complex now that is difficult to be a pan endoscopist like what dr krishna rao was a pan endoscopist doing everything now we cannot do everything because we have pancreatic biliary endoscopy we have a third space endoscopy and we have a regular luminal endoscopy plus in addition we have an advanced diagnostic imaging endoscopy there are people like for example in japan doing only narrow band imaging or magnification endoscopy and they're so good that they will spend 45 minutes in single lesion tell you everything about histology infiltration everything because so good. so i think we are having these three or four buckets now what i tell in fact our residents is that you can no longer be a therapeutic endoscopist like we were long back we now have to decide when we get into endoscopy whether we want to be a third space endoscopist a pancreatic biliary endoscopy they're totally different so in our unit now we are divided into three uh, specialties we have a next a group of people doing only third space they don't do pancreatic biliary there are people like me doing only pancreatic biliary uh, we want to do don't want say i want colonoscopy and all don't want then there are people doing intra luminal endoscopy so we divided it completely the future of endoscopy is going to be a sub specialization into these areas and because endoscopy is a mechanical uh, thing uh, you do large volumes you get an expert in this it doesn't require too much of intellectual things into this so you become good in mechanics so i think we have to subdivide ourselves and work in a specific area and then uh, this is a very important point to raise matthew i think this is what going to the future nagi when do you yes. think that uh, endoscopies will replace all kinds of surgeons uh, no i think it's more <laughs> than replacement it's a, i think it's a cooperative so we are trying to uh, Uh, give as much benefit to the patient as possible and i think this term surgeons physicians endoscopy should be replaced and all of us should be called uh, minimally invasive therapist whatever either you are a surgeon or endoscopy you are all minimally yeah. invasive and we try and become minimally invasive so that the patient can get the same therapeutic benefit is less invasive or less complicated uh, procedure so i think uh, basically future is going to be and again this is what we are doing in ayurveda it should not be physicians doing endoscopy or surgeons doing it should be together whoever has the skills hand eye coordination should start doing if you may be very good in laparoscopy um, even a physician is very good should continue i think a basic training in gastroenterology has to be restructured like what peter cordon say you do two years of gastroenterology and then you decide whether you want to become a minimally invasive laparoscopic person minimally invasive flexible endoscopic person or subdivide into a pancreatic biliary and so on so i think the future at least the patients are going to benefit if we are going to approach it that way salam nagi kashara uh, yes sir nagi sir what is the role of a radiologist therapeutic radiologist in your yeah. pancreatic biliary yeah i think this is another very important area in fact we have a specialist interventional radiologist pancreatic biliary because there are a lot of radiological interventions they are doing now come in fact there are a lot of rendezvous procedures we used to do all this complex type 4 hyla strictures ercp wise trying to put in multiple stents we realize now the most simpler way is you combine with the radiologist he puts in multiple wires and endoscopically we take this wires and do a rendezvous it becomes very easy very safe for the patient so there are a lot of procedures and of course there are bleeds which we can't control they would control especially small bowel bleeds and so on so there's a lot of um, combined procedures 
when I'm doing a very risky, um, say, ampullectomy, I always I tell my radiologist, be around this, uh, because if there's a massive bleed, I can't control. Immediately, it'll go in and then control it. So I think uh, there is a huge role, and I think all good uh, interventional endoscopy units should also have a good interventional radiologist to help them out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Nagi, one question regarding uh, endoscopic anastomosis between gallbladder and duodenum. I have seen uh, yes. some reports coming out. Uh, what are your thoughts? So we're about? doing, uh, I think this is a, a procedure which is sort of overdone a little by some enthusiastic endoscopists. The major indication is if you have a patient with advanced malignancy who also has a cystic duct obstruction and a cholecystitis, then instead of doing a percutaneous or a surgical uh, drainage, we can now very easily go in endoscopic ultrasound and then create a fistula between the antrum or duodenum and then put in one of these self-expanding metal stents, which are luminal opposing stents. So we do a lot of this, but only a specific indication in patients who have very advanced malignancy. In a patient who has a standard gallstone disease, there are some endoscopists who are trying to do this uh, create a fistula, go inside, remove the gallbladder stones and all. I am somehow not for it because I think the gallbladder is diseased in these cases, has to be removed. Optimum approach is a lap coli in these patients. Uh, so I think this is this is an important indication in patients with terminal malignancy having a gallbladder obstruction. Thank you. Ishwar, you want to ask a question? Thank you. Nagi, that was very excellent. Nice to hear you. Regarding, you said uh, as we go 2021 beyond, there are going to be less and less volume of ERCP, less masters like you there may be. So what's the training? Are there any better models or better avenues there like uh, simulation or better simulation models where people can go? Because a lot of trainees are asking as a surgeon yeah. to cut down the learning curve. Is there any better way of teaching or learning? Yeah. Again, Nishwar, that's a very important question because that's what's bothering us. How do we train people better in ARCP? In fact, training uh, in other modalities of endoscopy is not so difficult because animal models and also uh, even third space, we now have good animal models. But the problem with the ERCP is the pancreatic bile tract in most of the large animals, also pigs and dogs, is different from human, human beings. So it's not so easy to train exactly on animal. There are some simulators. We are working on that. The standard um, ERCP computer simulation is not still very good. There, there has to be work done on that. That's being improved. But this is one of the areas. The second, of course, is that now we have good mechanical models. And for those who are interested in learning ERCP, I would strongly recommend the Guido Costa Magna model. Guido and his um, group IO together have made this very nice mechanical model which can be used uh, for ERCP training, especially skills of cannulation. You can do spintrotomy, stenting, stone removal, and so on. So we'll have to practice on these models initially. I think the era of going directly to the patient doing a, a scopy is no longer uh, in, uh, acceptable. So what we do in our unit is we, we actually have a graded method where they go through these mechanical uh, models, then go through simulation, and then our um, gastroenterology PGs are told how to put in a side wing scope, remove stents and so on first. And once they get um, good at this, and then they're allowed to do selective cannulation, spintrotomy and so on. But I think still it's a long process compared to other endoscope procedures and we can only train a limited number of people uh, to become good because ER ERCP is, I think, more invasive than any other endoscopy procedure, especially pancreatitis and so on. And this can be quite disastrous to the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Nagi. Nagi, Nagi you, can can we, you have any more questions, President? Uh, I just wanted to compliment Nagi for the huge library they are having. Yes. And uh, must compliment for the largest gastroenterological hospital in the world, AIG. And uh, because of the COVID pandemic, we have not been able to visit Hyderabad. Otherwise, it used to be the dictum to go to Hyderabad once a year to yes. attend Nagi's workshop. Hopefully, maybe 2022, may, we may be able to April, attend in person. We're planning soon in April 2022. Mid-April 22, we'll have our next big workshop. So it's an invitation now itself for all of you. Should come. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for sparing your valuable time with us and uh, also Dr. Crow.
I leave it to Dr. Kanagwal to take the program further. And again, before we end, I just want to pay my respects to Dr. Krishna Rao. He is the one who was, who can be called truly the father of ERCP in our country. He is the one who brought it and then um, I also envy him that how he looks the same. He was 40 years back and now. There's no difference. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you I, still, I still remember you coming to the Wellington Hospital. Yes, yes. Me working in that narrow, small room <laughs> and saying, if you can do that, I think I, I don't have to be in PGI or anything, and they can do it. And I think you have done exceedingly well in enlarging the scope of endoscopy in India and as well as in the world. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Krishna Rao, sir. Thank you, Nagi, sir. Uh, with the permission of the president and the faculty, all good things have to come to an end. It's been a wonderful evening of learning from both legendary endotherapists. Thank you, Professor Tro, and thank you, Dr. Nagi, sir. Thank you, Dr. Suviraj and Dr. Krishna Rao, sir, for moderating the session. Now, we hand over the day's proceedings to Dr. Ishwar, our dynamic secretary of the IADs. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kanahavel. Thank you, Professor, Professor Sunil Popat, for an excellent presentation today. Because uh, today's presentation, both by Dr. Matthew Pro and uh, Dr. Professor Nagiretti, I think they were so scintillating talk with so much of uh, practice points, pearls of wisdom. I'm sure every surgeon will today onwards be, and already we all know IAGS has taken this training of surgeons in an art of, and science of endoscopy to a larger extent through their. Uh, regular fellowship training program, EFAGS and FAGI, advanced training program. And uh, I just want to convey also to Dr. Nagiretti that we have been using the Costa Magna a trainer in Trichy also with the Goindra, with the Pistola direction. I think we found it very useful, even though the easy animal model people used. So I think the training uh, on the surgeons uh, is also equally important. I am really appreciative of you. Uh, saying that it is not one man's job, whoever is competent or uh, the patient is right at the center, physician, surgeon, we all together with uh, making the best possible care. I think I thank both the speakers for heartfelt appreciation from all the viewers across the globe. And few thousands of people are coming on every alternate Wednesday, 8.30 to watch our IHS prime time. We made them proud and our certificates of appreciation both to you will be arriving shortly in the email. Please accept our appreciations, uh, sir. And of course, Suviraj, uh, as usual style, and also our, uh, my mentor and fatherly figure, Professor Krishna Rao, both uh, gave a good moderation. Let uh, all the uh, practical points come out from our speakers today. And as a Central Office, Honorary Secretary, I have a couple of pleasant things to update our viewers and also our members. As you all know, because of the COVID, we were not able to do the regular physical events, but still we are having the online fellowship courses of both the laparoscopy and the endoscopy is happening in a Medinet platform. People can go in and also the advanced laparoscopy three courses also with the 30 lectures are also there in oncology readily available for people to join. And the assessment will be in the subsequent on-site program or in 2022 February in Rajamudri, where we'll be doing it in GSL Medical College, doing our 19th annual conference. But in the meantime, in spite of the third wave on the doorstep, we are bracing ourselves to conduct and host two programs already pinned for this next month. The September 10th to 12th by uh, Randeep Wadhwan in Delhi in Falls, the Advanced Laparoscopy and Upper GI. And also Dr. Kanakevel himself, along with the, the Ramachandra Medical College, they have taken the courage to host twin events, Bonanza for all the delegates, both on the laparoscopy front, the FAGS, and also the endoscopy front, EFAGS. Both the programs are going to be happening. The chairman and all the conveners of the, our uh, surgical department led by Professor Krishna Rao and our Zamir Basa and all the people are coming there in person. I'm sure all of you will enjoy the delight of being in Chennai and not only the academic and also gastronomic delight, I'm sure you will enjoy. And uh, there are hundreds of people have already done online program. Their assessment, if they want to do it before coming to the annual conference next year, they can choose the option of coming to Chennai uh, during the third, final day on 24th to 26th, it's happening the Sunday. And please contact Kanagwell how they can come because they have done the theory part. They want to do the 
and the hands-on experience and also join in the life, they can do it very well without paying extra payment. But please contact Kanagwil regarding that. So we are all hoping to meet next year early uh, and with all of us vaccinated. In the meantime, and we are also like, I am sure uh, uh, Nagi uh, with the, the whole AAG team is doing a lot of work in the COVID front. We are also an uh, academic organization with our social responsibility. I've been doing something towards, uh, I mean, our uh, citizens' welfare by means of what we call the COVID task for IAGS. We have collected close to 50 lakh rupees. And the latest two events happened in the last fortnight is uh, donating 10 units of oxygen concentrator to all the hill stations where all that's really required, people even without cylinder. So it is uh, because of this uh, donations from uh, USA, from AIMS India, there by doing the wonderful science events. And also we are supplying uh, five pediatric COVID ICU uh, monitors also, because we are thinking the next wave may be affecting pediatric. So, so we are uh, trying to be, so we have coined the term IHS Sanjeevni, trying to save people and whatever little way we can do from the IHS. So, but I'm sure with a positive mindset and with the, all of us encouraging our police to get vaccinated, we have to look forward for better days. I'm sure with a positive note, I thank you all for having joined for another wonderful edition of uh, IHS Prime Time. Jai Hind. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 And uh, before we take leave, I would like to invite uh, both the faculties for Rajmandri IAGS 2022, our National Congress in February. And uh, we'll send official mission, but this is just uh, an invitation in advance. We look forward to meeting you again in the, the scientific programs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you sir. And with the permission, let me call it a good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Doc Plexus. Thank you, all the team behind us for making this flawless platform. Uh, we look forward for yet another exciting event in the coming fortnight. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.